Thank you, Andrew, and kia ora koto. Welcome to our panel on why copyright matters in 2020. My name is Jennifer Campion. I'm a law lecturer at uh, Te Piringa Faculty of Law at the University of Waikato, and I'm a member of the Tohotoa Board. Today, I'm delighted to introduce four fantastic panelists. They have a diversity of experience and they will be sharing their perspectives on this important topic, as well as taking your questions, which we are very much looking forward to. Michael Wolf is the Consulting Copyright Policy Lead at Tohotoa. Kylie Papalado is a Senior Lecturer in Law at Queensland University of Technology. Victoria Leachman is Head of Collection Access at Te Papa. And Thomason Slay is the Digital New Zealand Community Manager at the National Library of New Zealand. Our presenters will speak in that order. In the interest of time, uh, they're each going to introduce themselves more fully and we'll speak for about five minutes or so, and then we will open up for questions. So please do be adding those questions in the chat or on Slack. So thank you all for being here and I'll hand over now to you, Mike. Kia ora, and thank you, Jennifer. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking about uh, <laughs> Uh, honestly, one of my, my favorite things in the world to talk about, which is copyright law. As Jennifer mentioned, I am uh, the copyright policy lead at Toa Toa. I have uh, taught and been an activist in copyrights, um, in the copyright space, uh, and also am a law practitioner in the United States in copyright and internet law. Uh, so. I want to use my brief time uh, with you all beginning this panel uh, just to get a little bit of background that puts us on the same page about what it is exactly we're talking about uh, and why historically uh, we might have reason to think now is a particularly important time for the future of copyright law and with it, the internet. So, uh, Five five quick points in under five minutes. Uh, the first thing is what what it is we mean when we talk about copyright or copyright protected work. And the salient point for thinking about it on the internet is that copyright is a or an absolute absolutely ubiquitous uh, regulatory feature of, of cyberspace. So by that, I mean copyright attaches instantly uh, at the moment of creation uh, to original works throughout the world, uh, or almost entirely throughout the world, uh, at the minute those that works are made. So when you link up a bunch of computers, effectively copying machines, uh, and network them together, the internet, you're creating something that creates billions and trillions of copies regularly, every day, all the time. So this ha has made copyright one of the uh, OG internet issues uh, yeah, dating back to the earliest days in the 90s. Uh, Um, <laughs> which is to say that how copyright chooses to regulate the internet space uh, has profound impacts on how we use, uh, how we interact with service providers, how we interact with each other. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of feedback that's, that's throwing me off. Uh, but let me try to fix that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be an online event without at least a little bit of technical <laughs> difficulty uh, in, in any event. Uh, beyond that, and second point, this is an issue that's just important on its own bottom. The, the basic concept behind copyright law uh, is that the way that we communicate creative work to each other, the way that we communicate uh, uh, ideas and expression, is of utmost importance, and this is one of the ways, arguably the central way, uh, that we use the legal system to incentivize creation. 
So striking the right balance, being sure that we tell people or that, that there are rewards, uh, including monetary rewards and reputational rewards for making creative important work uh, is, is it, uh, the center uh, centerpiece uh, of modern uh, uh, the modern information economy economy. So this is something that we should care about regardless of the more pressing issues of the day. But beyond that, it's also something that's absurdly politically innocuous. Uh, it's not, even though uh, all expression is uh, effectively regulated by internet from the moment it's creation, it's not seen as creating uh, freedom of expression tensions, not by not by courts, not by states, not by international agreements, uh, essentially because the idea is we're incentivizing people to create new expression, to be expressive. Uh, so the fact that we have a legal system that says how and when you can share copyright protected work uh, doesn't uh, can be written off as something that doesn't affect freedom of expression issues. Uh, more or less at all, which means that when copyright industry or copyright interests uh, get involved in regulation of how we share anything online, which is what copyright does, uh, it's not seen as being potentially problematic. And because of this point, uh, it's attractive to uh, use copyright as a lever to talk about other things, things that reach beyond maybe the issue that uh, the central issues that we think about with copyright, you know, piracy, uh, or or striking that balance to incentivize creation. So it, you see this in, for instance, the uh, the world of intermediary liability. So if I upload uh, a video to YouTube, uh, whether or not I would be held, or whether or not YouTube would be held liable if the video that I upload is infringing. Um, striking that balance is important in copyright terms, but it's also important in term in competition terms. For YouTube being a monolithic cloud service provider uh, that has important uh, bargaining power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the music industry <laughs> means that there is an incentive for people to try and regulate that competition issue by shifting the boundaries of copyright protection. And we also see this in uh, information quality issues. So we there's a ubiquitous concern today about uh, addressed elsewhere at NetHui about misinformation issues uh, and about quality of information issues online. And part of that uh, is related to news media access. And among the potential solutions to thinking through how you write that ship if it has indeed gone off the rails uh, is it, in how people access information and where. Uh, so we see copyright sort of being used as a lateral move to address this issue through things like the draft news media bargaining code in Australia or through article 11 of their recent copyright directive in Europe. So there are, there are ways in which there are really other important issues that touch that might feel more pressing that because copyright is this thing on the side, this innocuous thing that we're all relatively comfortable with a trade off that, we don't see as being particularly problematic uh, that folks are able to address um, through the back door. Uh, and sometimes we don't, when you're dealing with issues of massive social importance, the, the sort of the key most pressing issues of the day on the internet, sometimes you want to tackle them head on and, and not through a, uh, a back door of another regulatory regime just because it's easier or just because it's more traditionally available. Um, and I, I'm, I, my, my, the last point I'll make here and, uh, is that it, these issues are particularly salient now in New Zealand uh, because the review of the uh, Copyright Act is happening now. So there, it's presently an opportunity to re-envision essentially the entire functioning of the Copyright Act subject to very important constraints that are imposed by international treaty obligations. Um, but these types of comprehensive overhauls of copyright law are regular feature of the system. It's happened four or five times in New Zealand over the last hundred years. Uh, in the United States, it happened, it, there were essentially two major overhauls in the last hundred years. Uh, and every time one of them comes up, it's an opportunity to completely re-envision how the balance is struck between creators and users. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and in the middle, uh, how the internet is structured, where liability lies for service providers, 
and there is probably not there will probably not be a more profound moment for thinking about copyright in Aotearoa than in 2020 2021 uh, with, uh, for the next cycle of copyright uh, legislation and drafting which could be uh, it could be many decades from now thank you mike that was so interesting and you know i really like that description of copyright as politically innocuous you know it's it's not like wealth tax it doesn't get us quite as excited but with our review coming you know coming working its way through the process uh, i definitely be keen to get more of your thoughts on that and i'm sure our audience will as well however i'll hold my questions and i'll hand over now to kylie who will be uh taking the conversation further around some of the legal aspects. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, hi, everyone. As Jennifer mentioned, I am a senior lecturer in law at the Queensland University of Technology, which is in Brisbane, Australia. So hello from across the pond. Um, I am also a chief investigator in the Digital Media Research Centre. So as well as researching copyright uh, and the intersection between copyright and creativity, I do um, a lot of research on, on internet regulation and the regulation of new technologies. And that's sort of what I want to talk a little bit about today, uh, leading on from what Mike said, because the, the title of this panel uh, and the, the theme of it, I guess, is sort of why, why I care about copyright now. With everything that's happening in the world, Black Lives Matter, COVID-19, the US election, why copyright now? Um, and also, as Mike said, the copyright has been regulated on the internet for a really long time. Uh, Napster was around in 1999 and sort of kick-started a whole bunch of cases around how, how we regulate how people share things on the internet. And um, so what I want to focus on today is sort of the, the lessons that we might draw from that history of copyright regulation for, for the challenges we face in the future in other areas of regulation. And I think it's interesting uh, here to start with the kind of harms that we're trying to protect against. Because when we look at why people are increasingly calling for regulation of online platforms like Facebook and Twitter, it's for things like uh, gender and race-based violence, for hate speech and ab abuse, for disinformation and, and fake news. And these are very different types of harms to copyright harms. Copyright harms that are generally financial, people have downloaded or copied content instead of buying it. But in the other areas um, that I just mentioned, the harms can be very much more personal, psychological, they're harms to people, to society, to democracy, and, and they can be very damaging. So an interesting question for me is why we started with copyright, right? Why start regulating an area where harm is not so invasive um, on the internet? And there, there are many reasons for that, but I want to focus on, on a few today and, and some of the lessons that we can draw from that. So one reason I think the internet, or we started internet regulation with copyright, is that um, precisely because it is about commercial interests. Modern copyright's not often really about individuals. The, the history of the internet is, is kind of a battleground between these big tech companies on the one hand and these big content creation companies on the other, both of which are well-financed, both of which have been able to lobby for or against copyright regulation. And the people that typically lose out in online copyright regulation are the users, the internet users of copyright material, because they are, they're a disparate group of individuals. They are not organized. They're not financed, so they haven't. They've struggled to have their collective interests recognised to any real degree in copyright regulation because they don't have any any lobbying power or, or very effective lobbying power, and that's a problem. And I, I think that's probably my first lesson that I would draw about what we really need to be aware of um, in in this new age of regulation is that 
so lesson one, I guess, is that power imbalances are real, particularly between companies and individuals, and they need to be addressed. Individuals matter, representation matters, and when we think about regulation for things like hate speech or racism on the internet, we have these big tech companies on the one hand and no real organisations on the other to fight against that. It, it's just people. So in terms of the practical levers that can get regulation, at, at least laws, through parliament, this can make things much, much harder, even though the harms are arguably greater. Um, another reason why copyright was regulated early was because it, it is what we call a strict liability law, which means that if you do the act, you've broken the law. Intent doesn't matter, motivation doesn't matter. So with copyright, once you make the copy without permission, you've infringed copyright. And the structure of the law makes it easy to regulate at scale in particular. It's easier to give directives to platforms to say things like, um, you know, we've told you this is an unlicensed copy, so you need to take it down. In copyright, where things get more complicated is around the exceptions and the limitations, where the user says, yes, yes, I infringed, but I have a legal excuse and this is what it is. And this is where platforms struggle because this is where they have to take account of context. Was the use fair? Was it for criticism and review or reporting the news or parody or satire? How do non-legal experts know how to make these calls, how to strike the balance between what's okay and what's not? And um, this is the area where copyright regulation is at its weakest. The, the platforms get away with not doing too much here because they push the onus back on the users to to prove their excuse and and as i said the the users here are the people with the least power um, so we end up in, in copyright with things being taken down which they probably shouldn't be with culture and creativity being stifled um, and this is my my second lesson which is that context matters copyright regulation on the internet largely ignores context, but this is not so easy to do in battles about free speech versus hate speech, or where the lines between truth and lies start to blur in reporting the news. Um, platforms and regulators cannot continue to ignore context if they want to regulate speech more effectively. Context is hard. It's really hard to do at scale. And I think this is the our, our great challenge in the future of online regulation is how to account for context at scale. Um, and this is where my third and, and last lesson comes in, which is that I think due process here is really, really important. One way we can start to overcome some of the challenges of, of context and, and people within the platforms, moderators, whoever, not, not being sure whether they're making the right call about taking content down or not, is to have really clear, really transparent, really well communicated policies and processes for people to complain, to appeal, to seek reasons, to engage in the process. Copyright does this okay. There is, a, there is an appeals process for the takedown regime. It's much better than other areas of law like defamation law, but it, it's imperfect. It, it's very imperfect. And I think we probably need to pay more attention to the takedown regime in copyright to learn from what's done well, what's done poorly, to, to um, make our systems better in the future for other areas of regulation. Um, and I'll stop there. So thank you. Thank you, Kylie. And such an important point about context, especially for uh, non-legal copyright uh, users. That's a nice point in our panel to move to you, Victoria, um, with your extensive glam sector experience. Uh, and I'll just note to the people chatting on Slack, we're, we're picking up on your questions and we will be coming back to those as well. But over to you, Victoria. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Tina Kato Kato. Um, I work for the New 
Museum of New Zealand Te Papa Tongarewa. Te Papa is New Zealand's national museum. Te Papa's role is to be a forum for the nation to present, explore and preserve the heritage of its cultures and knowledge of the natural environment. Um, the reason I'm really here is to represent an example of a practical application of copyright in the real world in the not-for-profit sector. Um, so it comes back to that point Kylie was making about context. Um, just to explain a bit more, um, Te Papa cares for a collection of over two million items of taonga Māori, art, natural history specimens and items of New Zealand history and Pacific cultures. Um, in addition to the copyright that exists in the collection, the staff of Te Papa are actually constantly creating copyright works and we also reuse other people's copyright works. We create literary works, film, animation, sound recordings, music, performances and artworks including photographs, illustrations, sculptures. I could go, go on and on. Um, I mention this in context because it's likely that a lot of my comments will focus on the digital surrogates of Te Papa's collections, but it's useful to remember that these aren't the only works where Te Papa is respectful for copyright. Um, a bit about me, I've been in the role of Head of Collection Access for about eight months now. Prior to that, I've worked for 13 years as the Papa's Rights Manager. Um, navigating copyright was and is a full-time job at Papa. The overarching goal of that role is to minimise copyright barriers so that Papa staff and members of the public can access the view, take, reuse and remix as much content as possible whilst balancing the competing organisational drivers of trying to make a bit of cash to do more and contributing to ensuring Te Papa's treaty obligations are delivered. Um, now, with regard to copyright and Te Papa, we devote a lot of resources to ensuring that copyright's respected. Like other galleries, libraries, archives and museums, Te Papa relies on public for funding, for donations to the collections and for donations of time and resources towards our projects. This generosity by the public um, keeps glams across New Zealand and the world produce, producing interesting activities and outputs for the public to enjoy and learn from. But this reliance on public contribution is one reason why the glam institutions are risk adverse and are reluctant to go into situations where there's uncertainty and possible reputational damage associated with getting it wrong with copyright. A good copyright policy and the practical processes to back it up are required to provide certainty in what is sometimes an uncertain and very opaque legal obligation on the glam sector. Um, in New Zealand, Te Papa is unusual in having a role devoted to providing advice and figuring out the least risky way of getting it going forward on copyright issues. Other organisations have passed this responsibility on to staff members who have other duties in addition to this. And most are not legal experts. In fact, I'd say all of them are not legal experts. They're people like me, an ex-collection manager who talked with legal experts, reads every piece of legal advice I can get my hands on, and I've worked to standardise copyright assessment and clearance processes. Um, so they're similar to that. Um, one thing I would say is, is the work I've done in the past has included taking on calculated risks, like publishing online orphan works, those in copyright works where the copyright owner could not be found. Um, so copyright clearance work, that's what's required to fulfill a growing public expectation that everything is online. Those of us that manage collections are very aware of the backlog that needs to be processed before we even get the most basic metadata for all collection items 100% accessible online, let alone the digital surrogates such as images of those collection items. This expectation of, um, and I'm going to bring COVID in here, everything must be online, that was really thrown into stark relief with the COVID lockdown. To Papa's experience was that not only did we want to deliver something of digital value to the public of New Zealand stuck in their homes, um, but the public of New Zealand were actually spending a lot of time online and were searching and expecting content to be available from To Papa. Our drop in physical visits was quite counteracted by quite high digital visitation. We saw spikes. Um, this is a familiar story across the world. Now, Te Papa has a wide range of collections content that had already been copyright cleared for reuse by both Te Papa and the members of the public. And the web team and the learning teams grew, drew on that resource to create a whole stack of um, 
quite cool things that people could do. Um, the online jigsaw puzzles was a surprise hit for us, but it, it worked. Um, we had quizzes and download activity books for kids, etc., as well as a whole stack of other activities. But despite having a bank of cleared content, copyright continues to be a barrier that prevents us from putting Te Papa's collection fully online. It's not necessarily a barrier because the copyright re representative says no no, or that that sometimes does happen. It's a barrier because of the amount of resource needed to assess whether a collection item is in or out of copyright, to research the identity and the location of the rights holder, and then to administer the process of asking for a copyright license. Um, yeah, it comes down, for me, the Copyright Act review is all about can the glam sector convince um, the copyright legislators to provide us a bit more of an open window with those exceptions um, with the exception framework to allow to allow us to deliver online what we're already delivering in the physical world and that's really the challenge for us going forward thank you thank you victoria uh, and it is it really is something copyright that impacts on the glam sector, uh, but al also we see it very much in the education space. And Thomason, you're going to be speaking a little bit about how we educate and the way copyright impacts that. So I'll hand over to you now. Kia ora, tēnā koutou ko hui hui mai nei, ko Thomason Slay toko ingoa, no te whanganui a tāra aho. E mahi ana aho ki te puna mātauranga o Aotearoa, ki te tīma atihi o Aotearoa, uh, um, it's really great to be here with you all today um, and thanks very much to my panellists and to Gen uh, previous panellists and to Jennifer. It was really interesting um, listening to your kōrero. And um, today I'm going to speak a little bit from the perspective of um, Digital New Zealand. So I work, as I said, at the National Library um, as a community manager for a website, um, digitalnz.org. And a very brief um, kind of explanation of how the website works for those who don't know is that we are um, an aggregator. So we are a search engine that brings together um, a wide variety of different digital collections from institutions all around Aotearoa so that they are accessible um, and easily searchable via one website. Um, uh, Te Papa is one of our esteemed uh, content partners, Kia ora, Victoria, um, but they range from big places like Te Papa to smaller institutions, um, for example, like the Fielding Library or Matoro Museum, um, who have really rich uh, and incredible uh, digital collections, which are perhaps not as findable um, via other search engines. So we're hoping to kind of make those um, accessible um, and raise them up for um, uh, kayako and akonga across um, the country so that they can find them uh, and use them in their research. Um, particularly in relation to um, our subject today, copyright, we, one of our um, strong co papas since Digital New Zealand's inception 10 years ago has, to be, has been to make uh, digital information, the copyright of the content we bring together um, as easily understandable and kind of as in plain English as we possibly can. Um, so you can appreciate uh, we're bringing together um, over 200, uh, over 300, sorry, uh, different digital collections from all sorts of different um, places. And the data that we bring together is very disparate. Uh, so the copyright um, uh, uh, statements and usage statements that we bring together are very, um, yeah, are very disparate. So our kind of position is um, slightly distant from Te Papa and Victoria's role um, as at the kind of practical um, level of um, ascertaining copyright, but it does afford us uh, a kind of overview of how the glam sector in particular, even though we do work with scientific institutions and other institutions, um, are kind of dealing with copyright and expressing it um, and some of the problems that they kind of rub up against um, in relation to the legislation. Um, and so very quickly, uh, my perspective in answer to the kind of question that we had for this panel, which was why should we care about copyright policy in 2020, given the maelstrom of the year? <laughs> um, and I wanted to open uh, that uh, this sort of section with a little whakatoki, which says, um, titiro whakamuri, uh, kōkari whakamua, which is look back and reflect so that you can move forward. 
Um, and the kind of lens I wanted to bring to this was thinking about um, the proposed um, curriculum change, which was announced last year, um, in which it is proposed that all kura and school across schools across Aotearoa, it will be compulsory to teach New Zealand's history um, from 2022, I believe, is the year that this curriculum change is proposed to be implemented. Um, and this strikes me uh, as like a very important moment in our history um, as a nation, um, sort of pedagogically, um, culturally, societally, um, how these histories are taught and uh, is extremely important that we kind of get this as right as we kind of can. Um, and for the library and for the glam sector also, if I can extrapolate more widely, this is a really significant moment for us in terms of supporting um, the work that educa educators are going to undertake across the country with the provision of online resources. Um, and as Victoria said, there is this expectation um, that has been present for a number of years now that, you know, if you can't kind of access something online, it kind of is invisible essentially to um, a number of people. And we have this um, pressure to make sure that resources are available for, for students and teachers. And it's incredibly critical that um, we think about what is available and kind of what stories and what kind of histories that will propel. Um, what is available online um, drives, uh, what kind of rises to prominent, what prominence, what kind of discussions, what kind of corridor is had. Um, and of course, copyright policy determines what GLAM institutions um, can make available online. And this, the kind of flow on effects to that will be seen uh, down the line um, as the kind of curriculum changes rolled out um, in, hist in, in schools across the country. Um, one thing I just quickly mention is that it's really exciting that this change was propelled by Rangatahi in New Zealand. So I, number, people would have seen that students from Osorohonga College um, presented a huge petition to Parliament of over 12,000 signatures to request um, a National Day of Remembrance for the New Zealand Wars, uh, but also that the history teaching of history is um, is available is made compulsory in schools. So it's really exciting that this kind of change was driven from from students and from young people in, the, in the, across the country. Um, so I would quickly just finish my section, my opening presentation by just saying there are a few kind of issues um, that will be good to kind of talk about and um, that um, some of which Victoria has already ra raised. Um, the problem of orphan works is kind of ever present for the glam sector um, making these accessible online, the huge resource that is required to ascertain uh, where the copyright lies and how to um, balance the kind of risk of making available versus our legal requirements um, as government institutions. Um, I'm kind of extrapolating these actually took the liberty of reading quite a few of the submissions to the Copyright Act from GLAM institutions. Um, also the library and archives exception, possibly extending that to museums and galleries. Um, the definition of educational establishments is something that could be looked at um, in the copyright um, review. And also some of the confusion around the kupu and terminology of the public domain, um, public domain, no known copyright, CC0, all these kind of terms that people use. Um, yeah, so I'm really keen in the nature of NetHui um, that uh, if there are teachers in the audience out there who know more about this, who want to share kind of their experience um, in the classroom, we're really keen to hear from you. Um, yeah, so kia ora, thank you. Thank you, Thomason. So we've got uh, about 12 minutes for questions. So I think a good place to start might actually be with one of the, the most recent questions there on the Slack because um, Orphan Works has been alighted upon. Um, and one, some of the challenges there with lack of um, registration of copyright and long copyright terms and that danger of having a work locked up until copyright expires because nobody knows who to ask. Uh, so it's a preservation problem, as you guys know, and a circulation problem. So I'm just wondering, um, obviously over to everyone in the panel, but particularly Victoria and Thomason, if you'd like to, to speak to that. Um, I'm happy to to launch in. Uh, as far as orphaned works are concerned, I don't think people realise that in order to become an orphaned work, you actually have to do a due, due, a due diligence search prior to the orphaned work being declared an orphaned work. While there's no um, it's, there's no legal defence as far as orphaned works 
at the moment for New Zealand. If you reproduce a work that's in copyright and you haven't contacted and got permission from the rights holder, it's an infringement. So it doesn't matter whether it's an orphan work or not. If you reproduce it online without permission, it's an infringement. But as far as Te Papa's practice is concerned, what we've... It, to, to balance that um, drive towards accessibility, i.e. being able to view it, view an item online, and our um, wish to respect the rights holder, we've taken a middle road where we've said, look, we will do a whole stack of research prior to designating something within our collection database as an orphan work, and then we'll we will publish it online in the hopes that the rights hold we prompt the rights holder to come and talk to us. That way we can we can provide viewable access to the item while still perhaps um, encouraging whoever's out there that we haven't managed to trace um, to come forward and contact uh, contact us. Um, the problem with it is is that in order to get to that point, we have done a really diligent search. Like we've we've gone and looked at all the places we could possibly look at for a person that may have inherited the rights to that wills, probates, you name it. We it's very much like a um, an investigative um, progress to try and try and try and get to the rights holder. Um, so it's not that we're declaring, oh, look, we don't, the, we, we've never known the rights holder, so everything's fair slather. There's actually a huge commitment regardless and a huge amount of work to do to get it to an orphan work status. So um, I look at that and I think having, looking at the orphan works of um, processes of other countries, what you're seeing is that even by creating a registration system for orphan works, there's still a stack load of work and commitment required of GLAMS to get it to that point. Uh, it would be nice to have some kind of safe harbour um, and protection against um, uh, the fear of um, being taken to court or, or having some kind of infringement action if you were to um, reproduce an orphan work online and the rights holder come forward. But there's also the recognition I have about the amount of commitment that we have to have in terms of resourcing to get it to, to get a work to orphan work status to begin with. I, I, I want to jump in with just a few observations about mm -hmm. the orphan works problem. Um, and and really, it's genesis in the context of the larger copyright regime. Uh, so this is reflective of of essentially two things. One is the earlier point about the ubiquity of copyright. It, it's an opt out system, and even then, only marginally, uh, effectively meaning that everything ephemera. Uh, did effectively disposable copyrighted works are, are wrapped up at protected and given relatively powerful statutory rights. And so not only that, but the term of protection is extremely long and this is mandated by international agreements. So New Zealand is currently at the international minimum, uh, life of the author plus an additional 50 years. So the scope of of what's uh, covered there is huge. It created you could imagine a, a much smaller orphan works problem, even if you could never get rid of it, if you had a more restrained copyright regime. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, the, there's a, a another key point here, which is that that the way that limitations and exceptions work is exceptionally difficult. It's part of what necessitates this cycle of, re of review of the law. Uh, because the law operates by giving away like excessive protection or, or, or a very large amount of protection uh, to everything under the sun, the exceptions to that uh, come in as almost an afterthought. And the, the protections are specified by international agreement. Uh, meanwhile, the exceptions are, are, are not at all. So or there, there is this regular process of saying, okay, what do, we, what do we want to have happen? How do we want people to use copyrighted works? A and then have them jump in on the back end. And this is one of those moments to say, hey, uh, over the last 25 years, 
what are the things that we found that we really want to do or really need to do that we cannot? Mm. Thomason, did you want to respond also on Orphan Works? Yeah, just quickly, I think um, there has mm. been some discussion in the glam sector about um, having a kind of more stringent definition of reasonable inquiry um, with the review of the Act. Um, and I think there's some interesting questions to kind of think about here, one of which it's kind of a careful balance that's required. Um, for example, if the reasonable inquiry to determine the copyright's owner is, is very um, kind of rigorous, it sort of cancels out a lot of small institutions, which, as Victoria said, um, struggle to resource copyright as it is. Um, but equally, a more clear um, definition of reasonable inquir inquiry could give GLAM institutions a little bit more confidence to know that they've done their due diligence and thereby allowed to make uh, material available online. And I guess that brings us quite neatly into the question of copyright review, uh, because we are thinking about how things have gone for the past 25 or so years and, and what changes we'd like to see. I just wonder, Kylie, if we might get your perspective on on some of the changes, um, because you know you've got that sort of perspective coming from Australia, um, thinking about copyright reform as we're heading into the twenty twenties decade. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm I'm probably not the best person to discuss the uh, proposed reforms in in New Zealand, but I guess just as a general point to um, just really emphasise what, what Mike was saying just then about um, the importance of these processes to really push for greater flexibility within the copyright regime, um, not just with exceptions and, and limitations, but all the little things that can happen around that that can restrain copyright in way of restrain creativity, sorry, and access to material in ways that that really are unnecessary to to um, properly give creators of content what they need. Um, I think Thomason was making a really excellent point there around often works, you know, and. And in my work, I've done, I've done a little bit of empirical research interviewing people at glam sectors and creators and other things. And I find that um, the, the libraries and glam sectors are often risk-averse, more, sometimes more than they need to, right? And I, I understand the fear there, but... Um, the more, uh, the more we tend to narrow our understandings of what the exceptions are, um, as Thomason said, increase our understandings of what we have to do for a diligent search for orphan works, you know, the practice can impact the law as well as the other way around. So I think, you know, um, I see authors getting permission to quote a single sentence in a book I think there's a valid argument that's trivial, and you wouldn't need um, you wouldn't need to get permission in the first place. But the more we do that, the more we create situations where that's expected. So I do think that it, it is on us to push back about those things, um, particularly around things like orphan works, where there's there's no clear person who's come forward that that might be being harmed by um, by copying without permission. In Australia, we've proposed a, a system to deal with orphan works, but it hasn't gone through Parliament yet. Uh, the most we've got to is a couple of years ago, we finally amended a an anachronism in our Copyright Act, which said that um, the copyright term, if you didn't know who the author was, uh, commenced when the work was published but you couldn't publish the work without the author's permission. So it meant that unpublished works where the author was not identified uh, potentially had copyright forever, right? The term never ran out. Um, we have finally changed that to, to deal with it being with creation rather than publication. But they're tiny, tiny steps. Um, and I, I really do think we can do more overall. Yeah. 
We are just about at time. Um, I would just like, I think, to finish with one of the comments on, on Slack that I think is quite interesting. And this one I think might be for you, Mike. Uh, you know, thinking about content creators, uh, Humphrey has said, it's always complicated knowing everything I create is based on copyright in the US, but even knowing what I have ownership of after I create it, where else I can share it. I just wonder if, if Mike, that's something you might be well placed to speak to with your American uh, law knowledge. I think you're muted, Mike. Oh. Uh, sorry, Mike, it looks like you've got uh, sound issues. So um, just to take on from that, um, Okay, um, so uh, I'm not really sure where to go from here after those sound issues. <laughs> um, I don't know, um, and from my perspective, I do I do agree there's a lot that can be done in terms of the Copyright Act review to um, help the not-for-profit glam sector navigate the issues and make more content available for the public of New Zealand and the world. Um, the only thing I would say is that uh, once you make things obvious for people or people can access it, i.e. view it, reuse immediately becomes an issue. So um, it's every time we, if, even if we unpick this particular problem in this part of the act, um, it's going to continue to, there's going to be other issues that fall out of that. That said, let's uh, keep iterating and try and get the Copyright Act better for the not-for-profit sector. That's really what I'm, I'm, I'm lobbying for. Um, and uh, let's see what we can do to improve things for New Zealand. Thanks, Victoria. And I think that's a really nice point too, to finish on a call to arms for all of us to lobby lobby for what we need in copyright law. Uh, we are at time, but I do invite uh, the audience to continue the discussion on Slack. And I uh, also just want to say thank you so much to each of our panellists, Mike, Kylie, Victoria, Thomason. This has been such a interesting, educational, really good conversation. And it's fantastic uh, that you've all supported our continuing conversations around copyright. So thank you all so much. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you.